Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening from here, Karachi, in Pakistan. Um, on behalf of the Center of Biomedical Ethics and Culture, CBEC, at the Sindh Institute of Urology and Transplantation, uh, a WHO collaborating center for bioethics, it is my pleasure to welcome you all to this webinar. Uh, this is the first in a series of three webinars designed to disseminate the WHO guidance document on ethics of vector borne disease. Uh, and we are starting the series with our own region, the EMRO region. The other two events are focusing on Afro region and Wipro Sierra regions uh, in the coming days in December. As the world focuses on the pandemic and rightly so, uh, which threatens our way of life and life itself, it is important not to lose sight of the equally important public health issues. Many of them uh, have actually assumed even a greater threat because of being sidelined in the past few months. We're not talking of dengue or malaria, et cetera, et cetera. So hence it's, the timing of this web webinar comes at the very right time. We have an excellent panel of speakers for this session and I uh, uh, have the privilege of introducing them uh, actually, Dr. Mandel will have the privilege of introducing them very shortly. But before that, there are some broad uh, description of this webinar for the next 10, uh, 90 minutes that I wanted to uh, share with the participants. And we have a sizable number of participants in this. Each speaker will deliver their respective talks for about 15 minutes. And after all the four talks are over, we will have the time uh, for question and answers. Uh, the participants are... Uh, um, of the webinar requested to send in their questions and answers in the Q&A, questions in the Q&A section featured in the bottom of the page of the Zoom application. Uh, they will be compiled by my associate, uh, Ms. Swaliha Shekhani, who will put them together and then put them up to the panelists uh, during the Q&A session. So moving forward, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Ahmed Bandil, who will be welcoming the participants, introducing them, and opening the session. Dr. Mandel uh, has been part of this uh, select group who put this guidance together. And to wind up the session would be Dr. Uh, Andreas Ries, another uh, front runner in the effort in this development of this these guidelines, uh, who will then uh, close the session. So Ahmed Mandel is a coordinator research of the research and innovations WHO EMRO, Cairo, Egypt. He is on secondment from the Higher Edu Institute of Public Health, University of Alexandria, where he is professor of epidemiology. He received his bachelor's uh, in, the, in medicine and surgery and a master's degree in pediatrics from Alexandria University. Subsequently, he went to UCLA um, School of Public Health, where he received his doctorate in public health in 1991. Dr. Mandel has served as Dean, College of Health Sciences, University of Sharjah, and Secretary, International Epidemiology Association. He currently serves on, uh, as a board member on several peer-reviewed journals, including the WHO Eastern Mediterranean Health Journal, the Journal of Epidemiology and Global Health, and Journal of Family and Community Medicine. He is a focal person for bioethics for our region and is a very active person in this area. Uh, and is also secretary to the EMRO Research Ethics Review Committee which is again a very active uh, body and he keeps us really busy. So uh, without further ado, uh, it is over to Dr. Ahmed Mandel uh, to introduce our speakers and say a few words off. Welcome. Thanks very much, uh, Professor Jafari. It's always a pleasure to work together with our collaborating centers on bioethics um, in the region. Uh, the Center on Bioethics and Culture, uh, hosted by the Sindh Institute of Urology and Transplantation in Karachi, has been one of the most active uh, centers uh, in bioethics uh, in the global network of bioethics collaborating centers, uh, coordinated by Dr. Andreas Reis. We are very thankful to Professor Farhat Muallam and Professor Ahmed Jafari for their support and coordination and support of WHO's program of work in bioethics. Um, on this uh, workshop or webinar on ethics and vector borne diseases, the first of four of its kind, we have speakers from the Seton Hall Law School in USA, Environmental Health Institute in Singapore, the Université Marianne Gubi in Congo, as well as uh, the regional office of WHO in, in Cairo. 
all participants uh, are joining us um, from different institutions and centers are welcomed and uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to be with you this morning or afternoon. Our first speaker is uh, Dr. Uh, Carl Coleman. Um, he is actually delivering on the overview of WHO guidance on ethics uh, and vector-borne diseases. Uh, Dr. Coleman has been very active in the, the coordination of this work over, I would say, more than two years. He's professor of law at the Seton Hall Law School in the United States and core faculty member of Seton Hall Center for Health and Pharmaceutical Law and Policy. Before joining this faculty, he was executive director of the New York State Task Force on Life and Law an interdisciplinary commission charged with developing public policy on issues raised by public advances. He served as bioethics and law advisor to the World Health Organization in Geneva and is a member of the Secretary's Advisory Committee on Human Research Protections of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Professor Coleman is the lead author of a, a very important book called The Ethics and Regulation of Research with Human Subjects. He also has numerous articles in leading legal and health policy journals and received his JD, magna cum laude, from the Harvard Law School and holds an AM in East Asian Studies from Harvard University and many other very important degrees from Georgetown's University School of Foreign Services. Ladies and gentlemen, we all welcome Professor Carl Coleman. He is talking to us about an overview of the WHO guidance on ethics and vector borne diseases. Professor Coleman, please. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let me just share my screen so you all see my slides. Um, go. And... Okay, um, so hopefully you can see the slides um, now. Yes, Yes, okay, good. Um, so I'm going to give a um, um, brief overview of the uh, vector-borne disease guidance um, as a background to the discussion by the, the other presenters. Um, so I wanted to just start, um, this is something all of you probably are familiar with, with just a very basic definition of what we're talking about, vector-borne diseases. So uh, vector-borne diseases are illnesses caused by vectors, which include parasites, viruses, and bacteria. Um, they can be um, transmitted, I'm sorry, they can be transmitted by vectors, including um, mosquitoes, sandflies, um, and the list on your, your screen. There are no, a number of vectors that transmit these parasites, viruses, and bacteria. Uh, the major vector-borne diseases account for approximately 17% of the global infectious disease burden and cause more than 700,000 deaths per year. So this is a significant um, impact on global public health. Um, and um, in light of this, uh, the World Health Assembly um, called on uh, WHO to provide guidance on the ethical issues associated with uh, vector control implementation. And that's, um, that was the, the origin of this report on ethics and vector-borne diseases. Uh, the primary audience for the guidance is persons who are working in vector-borne disease prevention and control. So that would include researchers, program managers, um, field workers, um, but the, the guidance is written also um, with an intent to reach a more general audience of people without direct involvement um, to appreciate the impact of vector-borne diseases um, on global public health and some of the ethical issues um, that are raised. Um, so, um, first question is why are ethics important? Um, important in particular with respect to um, vector-borne diseases. Um, the first reason is that vector-borne diseases um, are typically neglected diseases um, with a disproportionate impact on the world's poorest populations. Um, so as neglected diseases, um, like other neglected diseases, um, th these diseases are generally um, not given sufficient resources. And so there's insufficient resources for surveillance and control measures, uh, research and development of interventions. Um, and um, as a result of this, there's a lot of um, unnecessary um, death and suffering caused by these um, diseases. So that's the first um, major ethical issue is to situate them within the larger context of neglected diseases. 
The second um, major ethical issue is that because vaccines or drug treatments exist for only a few of the pathogens transmitted by vectors, uh, the primary method for controlling these diseases is through uh, controlling the vectors themselves through population level in interventions. And we'll talk a little more about some examples of these population, intervention, population level interventions. Um, but the key factor in these interventions is that they depend on collective action um, by the entire community, or at least by a very significant portion of the community. Um, and it's often not possible to get individual consent from every person who will be affected by these interventions. Um, the actions of uh, these, these interventions are intended to benefit everyone, uh, but in some cases, the benefits and burdens are not um, equally distributed among the entire population. Some people may suffer greater risks and also receive um, fewer benefits. And so that creates um, ethical issues in itself. Um, the third ethical feature of, um, of uh, vector-borne diseases um, is, um, relates to some of the novel methods of vector control, which involve genetic modification of mosquitoes and other vectors. And these um, interventions are um, largely experimental at this point, um, and um, they're very promising, and they um, have the potential to produce significant public health benefits, uh, but they also create um, risks, and many of these risks are really unknowns. They're, they're uncertain, and some of them are potentially um, irreversible. Um, so there are great concerns about um, the process by which these novel uh, genetic modification interventions would be deployed. So um, I just want to give you a few examples of some of the ethical issues addressed in the guidance without trying to go into um, how the guidance addresses them in particular. And after giving you a few examples, um, uh, what I'll do is sort of summarize some of the general overarching ethical guidance um, that applies to all of these examples. So um, one set of issues addressed in the report involves some of these population public health interventions, um, and in particular, uh, vaccine campaigns and mass drug administration. And, and some of these questions are questions that were posed uh, very specifically to the group by people working in the field. So for example, um, what should be the role of financial remuneration or other incentives? Can it be um, ethically appropriate to offer payment to people to encourage them to, to participate in vaccine campaigns, mass drug administration programs. Um, aside from vector-borne diseases, this is an issue that, that's currently being discussed in connection with, um, with the COVID-19 um, um, vaccine rollout, the role of payments and whether that would be a good way to generate greater support or may actually raise um, both ethical and, um, and public health issues in terms of effectiveness. Um, of its own. Um, the second question, is it ethically acceptable to implement these um, programs when some or all of the recipients will not receive direct benefits? So is it acceptable to ask people to expose themselves to risk um, without any potential to benefit personally, um, but solely or maybe primarily for the benefit of other people? Um, what is the role of informed consent? Uh, must individuals be asked for their informed consent before participating? in a vaccine campaign or mass drug administration program. Um, questions about tracking. Um, is it appropriate to track individuals during uh, vaccine campaigns or mass drug administration programs to ensure that optimum doses um, are taken? Um, and again, in the COVID context, this is an issue that just came up in the, in the United States a few days ago when the federal government had, um, um, proposed that states send names of people who receive the COVID vaccine to the federal government for tracking purposes. And a lot of people have objected to that on the grounds that this um, um, will create a, a significant invasion of privacy. So these issues are by no means unique to vector-borne diseases, um, but they certainly apply very uh, directly in this context. Um, there also were a lot of issues in the, in the guidance uh, related to screening and surveillance. So for example, um, under what circumstances is the surveillance of private living spaces um, to identify vector sources ethically acceptable? Um, under what circumstances is it ethically acceptable to use human movement data uh, for surveillance programs or to disseminate surveillance maps indicating the location of vectors? All of these questions raise issues um, about individual privacy, about the, the risks and benefits, the fair distribution of risks and benefits, because likely um, these surveillance measures um, would not apply equally to everybody in the community. 
um, but to those who are most likely to live with uh, vector sources or to be affected by vectors. And there's a disproportionate um, impact um, of those risks on particular segments of the population. Um, a second set of issues with respect to screening and surveillance um, involves larger population screening. So what ethical issues are raised by population screening? Um, under what circumstances can travel screening be um, ethically justifiable? And a final set of, of issues that, 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 that um, is, is, is very complex um, involves screening by blood or organ donation programs um, because part of their function is to ensure that the, the blood and organs that they um, they, they, they transplant or, or they transfer to, to, to recipients don't themselves cause disease. Um, on the other hand, in very high prevalence um, settings, if you um, attempt to screen out for anyone, for example, who um, may have been exposed to malaria, you may not have a sufficient supply of blood or organs um, left. And so the question is, how do you balance the need to have a good supply of blood and organs for donation with the importance of ensuring that you're not transmitting disease through the um, donation process. Um, okay, so those are just some general examples and um, there are other areas of the report where there are many other uh, specific questions like that um, raised. I wanted to talk generally about some of the recommendations uh, for the public health interventions that came out of the um, report that apply to some of the questions I just raised and to um, other questions as well. Um, so um, there are three recommendations um, on the slide and each one of these really um, affects all of the questions that I just discussed. So the first is that any limitations on autonomy, on individual freedom of choice, individual liberty must be necessary to achieve important public health interests that could not be achieved as effectively and efficiently by less restrictive means. Um, and there's really a lot packed into that um, that, that phrase, so I wanna um, focus on all the elements of that. First is that any limitations on autonomy must be necessary uh, to achieve important public health interests. So um, th there are two parts of that. One is that the interests you're trying to achieve must really be um, important. Um, you, um, you should not attempt to limit autonomy um, if the benefits are going to be very slight or very minor. So if, if there's um, a potential life-saving benefit or a benefit to significant health interests or perhaps even economic interests, that could justify a limitation on autonomy. But you have to make sure that the interest you're trying to achieve really is that at that very high level, that if your intervention is successful, it really will um, achieve something along the lines of life-saving or significant health saving, and that it is necessary to do this, um, that it would not be possible to achieve this in some other way. And so that ties into the um, second part of the phrase, which is that it could not be achieved as effectively and efficiently by less restrictive means. So there's an obligation to consider other ways of achieving this objective um, that would be less restrictive on autonomy. Um, but built into this phrase also is um, the idea that um, a more restrictive means, a means that involves greater limitations on autonomy, might be appropriate if the alternative, less restrictive methods um, would not achieve the important public health interest as effectively and efficiently. So that it can be appropriate to um, have a situation where there are two ways of doing things. One is less restrictive, one is more restrictive and to choose the more restrictive way if a conclusion is made after a reasonable deliberation that the less restrictive way would be less effective or less efficient. So there's, a, again, a lot packed into this. It's really kind of elaborating a process of analysis that has to go into thinking about public health interventions and the different ethical issues at stake. Um, second point here is that the expected benefits must exceed the aggregate risks and burdens involved so that in any kind of um, public health intervention, there has to be a weighing of the benefits and burdens and the, the weighing of this benefit burdens is, is in the aggregate. So um, you look at a population level of all the different burdens that would be involved and all the different benefits and you determine um, based on what you know and can reasonably expect, which outweighs the other. That's 
the first step in the process. Um, but then the third point comes in, which is that once you've done that weighing of benefits and burdens, you also have to consider the distribution of the benefits and burdens. So the benefits and risks of the intervention should be fairly distributed among all segments of society so that um, you may find that the aggregate benefits outweigh the aggregate burdens, but all of the burdens will be borne by a particular segment of society and all of the benefits will go to other people. And that wouldn't be fair, that wouldn't be equitable. Um, and you need to consider both of these. And, and, and if it turns out there is a, an imbalance in the benefits and risks on a distributional level, then um, steps um, should be taken to try to address that and minimize that to the extent possible. Um, the importance of community engagement was a point that came up um, a lot in the deliberations and is really emphasized at length in the um, guidelines. So just um, a basic definition is community engagement means involving the community to ensure that their concerns are understood and considered as part of the decision-making process. So this involves um, engaging with the community before decisions are taken and in the process of implementing them as opposed to just implementing everything from the top down. And um, community engagement is particularly important with vector-borne diseases because, um, as I said before, the risks and benefits of many of these control measures affect large segments of the population, but moreover, the effectiveness of them often depends on broad levels of public participation. So if you don't have community buy-in and support, um, it, the interventions are simply not going to work. And the best way to ensure that interventions will work is to make sure that, that you've taken into account um, the views of the community. Um, and then just a, a few final points. Um, there are many other recommendations in the report. I just wanted to highlight a few. Um, one is the importance of considering the social factors relevant to the risk of being exposed to, infected with, or suffering harmful consequences from vector-borne diseases. And these include uh, factors such as gender, age, socioeconomic status, migration status, um, and it's important to take these into account because these have a very significant impact on the distribution of um, vector-borne diseases. Um, and to the extent possible, um, um, public health programs um, should seek to minimize the impact of these factors, um, sometimes um, requiring the investment of greater resources to do so. Um, decisions about the release of genetically modified vectors, which I, I referred to in the beginning, re require a robust process of risk assessment, um, as well as community engagement. Um, and then the final point um, that the report emphasizes is the urgent need for greater research on vector-borne diseases, not simply on the scientific issues, but also some of these um, ethical process issues, like the best processes for community engagement and for public communication. Um, so that's in general a, a, an overview of um, the report, and I'm sure many of these um, issues will be explored further in the remaining um, presentation. So I look forward to the rest of the discussion and to, um, to your questions um, later. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Coleman, for an excellent presentation on an overview of guidance on ethics and vector-borne diseases. Uh, Dr. Coleman actually spoke about why ethics and BBDs Examples of ethical issues addressed, se screening, surveillance, prevention and control measures, and organ donation. He uh, spoke about the recommendations and the guidance of public health interventions, as well as importance of community engagement, and ended by the need for more research on vector-borne diseases to be able to address ethical issues highlighted in the guidance document. One question, uh, Dr. Coleman, appears uh, in the Q&A box from Natasha Anwar. She is asking, who determines benefits and risks for the public? Should such public health interventions be required to be evaluated by a national bioethics committee? Over to you. Um, well, that's a, that's a key question. Who makes these determinations? And the report does discuss that. Um, um, part of the emphasis on community engagement um, is because the, the identification and weighing of risks and benefits um, shouldn't be seen as primarily um, a, an expert determination. It's a determination that involves experts certainly, but also needs to take into account public voices. Um, if there is a bioethics commission in, in, in a country, that would certainly be an important um, body to be involved in it. But even at the commission level, a sort of an, an, an expert um, 
viewpoint. So um, one of the one of the um, points that the report really emphasizes is is, is the need to um, involve diverse people in risk benefit assessment. Um, um, even within the level of experts, experts not only in the scientific questions, but also in, in, in sociology and anthropology um, in communications um, to come up with um, an identification of all the different kinds of risks and benefits that are important to people, um, and then to um, make sure to involve the community in that process. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Coleman. I'm sure there will be more questions to come. But I would like now to move to our second speaker, uh, who is Dr. Samira al Iriani from the Regional Office of WHO in Cairo. Dr. Samira received her PhD from the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine 11 years ago. Um, prior to joining WHO, she was Associate Professor in the Faculty of Medicine, University of Sana'a in Yemen, teaching medical entomology and conducting community-based and field-oriented research on vector bone diseases in Yemen and beyond. She is now technical officer for vector control at the regional office of WHO in Cairo and supports endemic countries in the region in combating different types of vector bone diseases as you will see from her presentation through providing technical assistance for implementation and capacity building. So please welcome Dr. Iriani who's gonna talk about major vector bone diseases and vector control response measures in the Eastern Mediterranean region. Dr. Samira Iriani, please. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ahmed uh, Mandel. It's a pleasure, my pleasure. Good, mo good morning, everyone, good afternoon. And it's my pleasure to be here. And this is a good op opportunity to present for you the overview of the major vector bone diseases and vector control response in our region, in the Eastern Mediterranean region. So first slide, please. Next slide. Uh, the slides are not moving. Uh, yeah, okay. Thanks. So next slide, please. So as you see here in this uh, slide, uh, the major vector borne diseases are many associated. Um, sorry, can we go back to the first slide? Yes, so the major vector bone diseases in the Eastern Mediterranean region are associated with significant morbidity, uh, disability and mortality. Uh, we have the mosquito borne diseases, uh, malaria, an important uh, major vector bone disease transmitted by the female Anopheles vector. And we have also the Aedes borne uh, transmitted diseases, uh, dengue, chikungunya, and also yellow fever. And we have also other uh, mosquito borne diseases like Rift Valley, West Nile, and uh, lymphatic filariasis. Uh, the cutaneous uh, leishmaniasis, visceral leishmaniasis, these are uh, major vector borne diseases in, in our region transmitted by the sandflies. Uh, and uh, we will see in the, in the coming slides uh, the burden of these diseases. Uh, Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever. Uh, is widespread in the region and uh, it, is a, it, may, it is a major threat to the public health services because of its high fertility and it is among the uh, industry, livestock industry and agricultural workers are the most infected and the vulnerable populations. And uh, the oncocyte cases are the, known also as the soda because it causes a discoloration of the skin is transmitted by the black flies and it is endemic in two countries at the moment. And we also have the schistosomiasis, uh, which is transmitted uh, by the uh, snails. Uh, next slide, please. So these, if we map these uh, vector-borne diseases, and many of them, if you saw in the photos, they are uh, stigma, the stigmatized uh, illness. They cause uh, disfigurement and also uh, uh, scarring of the skin like the leishmaniasis. So if you map them, we find that there's overlapping of distribution of these reported vector bond diseases in the region. So in the legend here on the right, uh, the darker it goes, the more number of uh, vector bond diseases are overlapping in the same area. So vulnerable populations can have uh, co-infections of more than one disease, uh, depending on the area, if they have uh, 
more than one disease, they can be infected with uh, more than one disease. So the, the darkest color is uh, Sudan, uh, Yemen, and Somalia. These countries have uh, seven uh, vector bond diseases or more overlapping in the same areas. Next slide, please. So we start with malaria. Uh, so recently, the World Malaria Report uh, 2020 uh, was published uh, just this month, and it estimated that 5 million cases are reported were reported in 2019. Uh, we have, uh, can we go back, please? Uh, malaria, so yeah. So we have uh, eight countries which are malaria endemic uh, countries. Uh, and uh, six of these are burden reduction stage. Uh, the plasmodium phosphorum is the predominant uh, plasma, uh, malaria species. Uh, and it is mainly in the Arabian Peninsula and in, in countries in the Horn of Africa, Djibouti, uh, Somalia, and Sudan. Remainder is plasmodium vivex, mainly in Afghanistan and Pakistan. So if we look at the two countries which are contributing, the, the, the constituting the, the majority of the cases are Sudan and Yemen. Uh, they share the, of the estimated malaria cases in 2019. We also have two uh, countries uh, in yellow here, which are the elimination stage and the remainder of the countries are malaria free and pre uh, prevention of uh, re-establishment. Uh, next slide, please. So we, there are many uh, malaria vectors, but we have uh, primary malaria vectors, uh, mainly the Anopheles arabiensis uh, in the Horn of Africa and Arabian Peninsula. And we also have the Anopheles stephensi uh, in the Middle East, in the Pakistan, and uh, Culicephasis, Anopheles cubulicephasis in Pakistan and uh, in Afghanistan. Next slide, please. So at the moment, the current challenge, uh, can we go back, please? Yes. Um, previous slide. So at the moment, the current uh, challenge is also the invasive Anopheles stephensi, uh, which its native areas are the Middle East and uh, an important vector in Afghanistan, India, Iran, Pakistan, but recently have been established in Djibouti. It was an invasive, now it is established and it's played an important role in the transmission of uh, malaria cases during the malaria outbreak in 2018 and, and previous uh, years. And cases have started increasing in Djibouti and it is believed it's because of this Anopheles stephensi, which has been incriminated as the malaria vector. Uh, next slide, please. So WHO response to the spread of the invasive Anopheles stephensi, it recognized it as a threat and there was a technical consultation in June 2019 and recommendation was to add a theme to the malaria threats map, which you will see in the, the next slide. And uh, this is to monitor the invasive uh, vector Anopheles stephensi and its spread uh, in the regions. And also as a recommendation of that meeting, the technical meeting is to uh, have a published a vector alert. So a vector alert was published, giving guidance uh, to countries to support them with uh, recommend action uh, uh, points on uh, the surveillance uh, of the vector. Uh, and this uh, vector alert has also been translated into uh, many languages, including the Arabic language. Next slide, please. Um, so in progress, there's also establishing networks with other partners in the region for sharing information. So this slide shows you the, just the malaria threats map. So here, uh, the invasive vector uh, theme has been added to monitor the spread of the Anopheles stephensi. Uh, next. So this is the malaria threats map. So the green dots are showing you where the, the vector is native and the red dots is showing you where it is now invasive. So in our region, it's, invasive, it's been reported in Somalia, Djibouti, where it's established in Djibouti and also reported in Sudan. Next slide, please.
So just to, uh, this, uh, this slide shows you uh, photos of uh, breeding sites uh, during, taken during missions. Uh, where Anopheles stephensi was found breeding with Aedes aegypti. So these breeding sites are indoors uh, with houses, uh, inside houses. Uh, if you see the, the photos on the uh, right, the, these are rooms inside the houses and people are living in these houses. If you see there's a yellow arrow showing the bike, the child's bike. And then next to outside this room, there's a, a mattress so these were very productive for both uh, Anopheles stephensi and an Aedes aegypti. So the people in these houses, they are actually getting bitten during the day by Aedes aegypti and during the night by Anopheles uh, stephensi. Also other sites are in, in the coolest, in these coolest on the left, the old ACs, where we found Anopheles stephensi and Anopheles Aedes aegypti. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So this slide, just to show you um, uh, the, the trends of leishmaniasis and the burden of leishmaniasis, there's two clinical forms, the cutaneous leishmaniasis and the visceral leishmaniasis. So the cutaneous leishmaniasis is actually more than 70% of cutaneous leishmaniasis uh, is, uh, comes from our region uh, for the global uh, report. Uh, and we see that there's an increase of trend, upward increase uh, when uh, data is presented from, from 1998 to 2019. Uh, the visceral leishmaniasis is high burden in, in Iraq, Somalia, and Sudan. And Somalia, actually, there's only visceral leishmaniasis. Next slide, please. Um, these just a slide to just to uh, provide you to present to, to you this uh, the specters of leishmaniasis, which are the filobotamine uh, sandflies, and there are major vectors uh, for the anthroponotic uh, cutaneous leishmaniasis, the human form, uh, which is transmitted by the filobotamus surgenti, the zoonotic uh, cutaneous leishmaniasis. Main uh, vector is filobotamus papetsi, and the visceral leishmaniasis. The main vectors are. Uh, Philobotamus uh, orientalis and Alexandra. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide just is just presenting uh, the threat of dengue and other Aedes born diseases. So mainly this is mapping uh, dengue reported cases and outbreaks. Uh, so uh, the principal vector is Aedes aegypti. And the countries which are in uh, colored in darker uh, light, uh, darker brown, uh, darker color is the, where the where it is endemic, where dengue is endemic, and reported uh, outbreaks and cases are usually following the floods. Uh, we also have in Afghanistan in 2019 because of the invasive the detection of the invasive vector Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus. There were a number of cases reported, dengue cases, local dengue cases, about 15. And also during 2018, 2019 in Oman, this uh, Oman is a, an endemic for Aedes aegypti, but there was an outbreak during end of 2018 to uh, into 2019. Uh, next slide, please. So this slide just, is just presenting the distribution of the Aedes uh, aegypti and the Aedes alpifecta. So the principal vector in the region is Aedes aegypti. Uh, it is a vector of dengue and also chikungunya in the region and uh, yellow fever, which is mainly in Sudan. Uh, so the, we have endemic countries for Aedes aegypti. We have reported uh, invasive uh, uh, Aedes alpifecta in a number of countries in the red color. And then we have also in Egypt in 2015, 2017, uh, the vector was reintroduced and uh, led to an outbreak during 2015 and 2017. In Iraq, I have an empty circle because it has been reported there, the Aedes aegypti, however, it has not been confirmed. Next slide, please.
<laughs> so this is just a slide just to show you uh, the effective, the available effective proven vector control approaches. We have the insecticide base, which is insecticide treated nets, and those which are sprayed uh, on the walls, uh, called, known as indoor residual spraying, and also space spraying, which I will give you an uh, overview in the, in the coming slides. We have environmental management, which is elimination of old uh, tires and containers. This is mainly breeding sites of Aedes aegypti, uncovering and emptying uh, containers. Uh, also insecticide used as uh, repellents, uh, topical repellents, and on impregnated in clothing and improvement of houses to prevent uh, mosquitoes or other vectors entering the houses, uh, biting or also plastering the wall to prevent any uh, laying eggs in the walls uh, like uh, sand flies. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just a, a slide to show you uh, the uh, current, the pre-qualified uh, vector control list, uh, which is uh, vector uh, insecticides that are uh, uh, assessed by the pre WHO pre-qualification team uh, to, to assess them for their safety and their effectiveness. And if you just click, please, just to show you, just to click, just put next and then yes. So this is where the, the vector control list can be downloaded from here. And it, uh, it is updated uh, based on uh, any new updates for the insecticide. Another click, please, just to... So if you download, you have a list of where, uh, the names of the uh, insecticides with the companies that are pre-qualified and that should be procured uh, for effectiveness and for safety. Uh, and uh, these are insecticides for indoor residual spraying, for space spraying, for lava siding. And it also, the list also includes the long lasting insecticide treated bed nets and the companies that have been pre qualified uh, and other uh, uh, vector control interventions. Next slide, please. So the core vector control interventions. Uh, so mainly the, the region is targeted using uh, ITNs to target malaria uh, vectors. Uh, so we have uh, the form long lasting insecticide nets, which are manufactured in the companies uh, during the manufacturing, they are impregnated with a safe uh, uh, class of insecticide known as pyrethroid. Uh, and this is, has been assessed to be the only safe uh, insecticide for humans to use in uh, and the bed nets. So if you look at the photos on the left, these are the type of bed nets. There's rectangular and there's conical. And they are dis distributed free of charge to all age groups to, cover, to achieve the universal coverage. Uh, and, uh, they, and the total of 13.5 uh, million were distributed in 2019. One bed net per two persons. Next slide, please. Next slide. Uh, the second core vector control intervention is indoor residual spraying uh, of insecticides. There are currently five classes of insecticides and uh, these are implemented in countries like Sudan and Yemen as routine campaigns, annual routine campaigns. In other countries like Somalia, Pakistan uh, and, and Afghanistan, these are response to outbreaks. Uh, in Djibouti, the first uh, IRS campaign was implemented last year as is an, on a small scale. And this year it was also uh, implemented. Uh, these, uh, this indoor residual spraying uh, targets vectors that enter the houses and rest on the walls. So the insecticide, which has is just pre-qualified and has been assessed for safety, is sprayed on the wall. And when the vector comes to rest on the wall during the blood digestion and development of the eggs, it's supposed to be picking the insecticide and it gets killed. And so currently we have uh, five classes of insecticides, but we have a challenge of insect development of insecticide resistance in these uh, vectors. And in this method, if you see here in the photos, uh, the, in, in order to spray the, the huts or the houses or the rooms, 
the belongings or the furniture needs to be removed for better uh, spraying on the walls. Uh, and this needs consent and social mobilization in order for people to, uh, to uh, participate in this uh, uh, important uh, court intervention and also to raise the awareness how important uh, it is to spray these houses and at the same time to give them clear instructions uh, on that they should stay outside for one hour, for example, after spraying and then uh, in order to avoid any skin irritation or eye irritation if they go uh, in uh, before that. Next slide, please. Next slide. So uh, vector control is also used against leishmaniasis in a number of countries. Uh, indoor residual spraying is targeting leishmaniasis in Iraq, Morocco, Saudi Arabia, and Syria. Uh, in Iran, where IRS uh, was used against malaria, it uh, was reported that it greatly reduced the uh, anthropomatic uh, cutaneous leishmaniasis in many foci in Iran. Uh, bed nets, insecticide treated nets are also used uh, for protection in Iran, Iraq, Saudi Arabia and Syria and also space spraying is reported to be used in Iraq, Jordan and Saudi Arabia, uh, in addition to environmental management. Next slide please. Uh, for the control of Aedes transmitted uh, diseases, uh, so we have space spraying, fogging, uh, again, the, the sprayer here on the, in this photo, he has a fogging machine, he enters the house, he sprays, he fogs the, uh, the rooms, and then he goes out. So there needs to be prior consent, uh, people need to be outside, and there are ethical issues because if the sprayer is not well trained, uh, he may not uh, do it properly and may, uh, and the people who are living, household members may, uh, it may lead to the, the safety uh, hazardous to their safety because of this when some, once when I was in the field I found that the people were still indoors while they were uh, fogging so there needs to be uh, clear instructions and well trained uh, sprayers. Uh, in addition to this so this space spraying indoor and outdoor this targets the adult stage in addition to the uh, space spraying or the fogging there's also lava source management uh, which can I see the next slide please. So the uh, source uh, reduction or larval source management, uh, this searches and eliminates the potential breeding sites. Uh, and so you have uh, usually uh, people entering the houses and searching the water storage containers to I identify whether these are uh, containing vectors breeding or not, mosquitoes breeding or not. And then they eliminate uh, through filtering or through removing uh, this water container if it's an old water container and just standing there and also raising awareness on how to, uh, to for the household members, how to prevent uh, breeding by covering uh, these containers, washing them frequently, uh, scrubbing them from the in, from inside the containers as these as the eggs of these Aedes aegypti usually attach and can uh, live uh, for many months uh, in dry without water and then when they flush they emerge uh, they hatch and emerge uh, and so these uh, this is really uh, into the households they people enter the household search and it is sometimes uh, done uh, frequently during the outbreaks uh, in order to, ma to maintain the low uh, vector density. And during outbreaks, uh, sometimes there are issues that uh, people uh, uh, start uh, losing interest if the awareness is not raised properly or uh, important uh, key messaging is not uh, conveyed to these uh, household em members. So you can get locked or houses or refusals uh, and also uh, during an outbreak uh, in Sudan, uh, for example, we found that the clay pots known as zeers, they were productive uh, breeding sites and these were outside, so they were confiscated in order to, uh, to reduce the vector density. Again, this is ethical issue as these are taken away from the people and they are essential 
uh, water uh, storage containers uh, that uh, are needed to keep water cool and for drinking also. Uh, so, uh, but again, uh, during an outbreak, this is an, an important of this is to uh, reduce the vector and to, to manage the disease in order to prevent people from getting very sick or dying. And also coolers uh, are also inspected and examined for any uh, breeding of Aedes aegypti during the search and elimination. Next slide, please. Uh, Dr. Samira, could you uh, please uh, uh, conclude in the next couple of minutes? We are running short of time. Thank you. Okay, yes. So uh, now here we have just photos for the situation in our region, which is the humanitarian emergencies, uh, the population movement into areas at risk of malaria. Also the internally displaced persons are moved uh, forcibly into other areas where there is no access of healthcare and again, uh, exposed to infectious uh, bites. Uh, and the region carries 64% uh, of, of the refugees come from this region. Next slide, please. There's a delay of transfer, that's a problem. So uh, again, just an overview of the vulnerable populations in the Eastern Mediterranean region. So we have people being displaced uh, to areas where there's risks, uh, higher risk to malaria and other vector-borne diseases, the poor housing, the uh, inadequate uh, domestic water supply, lack of adequate domestic water supply, which leads to increasing risk to exposure to infectious bites. Uh, also implementation of vector control interventions. Uh, it's important to seek prior consent uh, from the targeted households for implementation and the implementation of vector control interventions should be planned well uh, with the capacity to implement uh, a good uh, vector control, in, a timely vector control in order to uh, have an effective uh, implementation and target the vectors uh, effectively. Uh, in addition, there needs to be more female vector control staff for greater access to households, uh, implementation of evidence-based interventions through strengthening capacity for vector surveillance and better coordination with the local community leaders and academy for research, the use of WHO pre-qualified insecticides and equipment in order to uh, have a safe uh, and effective implementation and strengthening preparedness and planning and intersectoral approach for prevention and control. Also mobilization of domestic uh, resources for timely allocation uh, this will also support uh, an effective implementation on time uh, plan. Uh, next slide, please. So just, just a quick uh, overview that uh, the region has developed the regional plan of action for implementation of the global vector control response, uh, which was uh, developed in 2017 and endorsed by all member states. Next slide, please. So just these, these are the pillars uh, I won't go through as uh, just to strengthen enter and enter uh, intersectoral action, engage and mobilize communities, enhance vector surveillance and monitoring and evaluation of interventions uh, and scale up, uh, integrate tools and approaches. And also most important, also the foundation is enhanced vector control capacity and capability with increased basic and applied research and innovation. Next slide, please. So just some, uh, an overview of regional activities to strengthen vector control response. So we have been, a number of countries have been conducting vector control needs assessment, which is assessing the needs and the, gap, the gaps in vector control in order to strengthen vector control. And uh, capacity building activities are also being conducted in the region for insecticide resistant management, uh, for capacity building also in, in tropical disease implementation research methods and ethics. Next slide, please. Uh, again, uh, training of trainers for indoor residual spraying in, or, in order to ensure that everything is implemented well and in a safe way. Uh, also, uh, strengthening uh, dengue surveillance. Next slide, please. So during COVID-19, uh, some key recommendations for vector control 
to ensure that people are still protected, even though there is a COVID-19 pandemic. However, malaria transmission continues and other vector-borne diseases continue. So uh, the key message is to ensure continued access to use of recommended ITNs, to distribute them, but also to adhere to safety protocols like physical distancing and uh, using a lot of uh, disinfectants. Uh, and, uh, and also uh, to continue uh, IRS uh, where it is needed uh, and uh, to again to adhere to uh, safety precautions and to continue I, uh, insecticide resistant monitoring to ensure that the insecticides are monitored uh, for the, their uh, effectivity. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Uh, because of COVID-19, uh, missions are limited to the field. So we have gone online, virtual, just like this uh, meeting. So to continue building capacity of the national vector control staff on vector surveillance and control and collaboration with International Institute for Support and Vector Surveillance and Monitoring to generate the evidence for implementing effective vector control. I think this was my last slide. Uh, if you check. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Samira, for a very elaborate presentation on vector borne diseases and vector control response in the region. She highlighted the most important vector borne diseases in the region and the overlapping distribution of some of these diseases in countries in the region. She highlighted the malaria burden, the leishmaniasis burden, the dengue and other AIDS-borne diseases burden, as well as the fact that many of these diseases are preventable through suitable prevention and control measures. She also highlighted the problem of refugees, migrants, and internally displaced persons in the region. Unfortunately, this region is responsible for two thirds of uh, migrant populations uh, worldwide. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Samira. There were four questions in the chat box for you, two already answered. One about uh, community consenting and the other about response to the COVID-19 pandemic. But there were two more questions by Natasha Anwar and Faiz Ahmad Reza. Maybe you wish to type the answer in the chat box in the interest of uh, time, because uh, we would like now to move to our third uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Joelle Aiti. She uh, is presenting on vector control and surveillance um, ethical concerns. Dr. Joel is presently Director of Environmental Epidemiology at the Environmental Health Institute in Singapore. Um, she's also adjunct assistant professor at the Duke Medical School and has 18 years of experience in public health policy, vector control operations, community advocacy and scientific uh, research. The interests uh, include assessing the impact of environmental determinants on population health and program evaluation. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Joel Ike. She He's talking about vector control, I'm sorry, he's talking about vector control and surveillance uh, ethical concerns. Dr. Joel, please. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ahmed. Um, I will now attempt to share my screen. Just give me a second. And Um, is that okay? Is the screen, is it all right? It's not on screen share mode. I think we are seeing two slides right now. Oh, um, hang on a second. Doesn't help, right? This doesn't help? No, it doesn't. <laughs> you can carry on. <laughs> Sorry. Um, how can I do this? Yeah, this is better now. Perfect. Excellent. Thank you. Please okay. go. Okay, I think can, let's go with this, all right? Okay, I'm just yes, going to go nice. ahead. Um, so, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, a very big thank you to the WHO uh, and also uh, the um, organizers for um, this um, webinar. So very happy to be here uh, and to hear from all the previous um, experts uh, that they've lined up for uh, this particular webinar. And I'll just jump into mine. 
So I'll be talking about um, why we do public health surveillance, um, what are some of the disease control measures available to us, and what are some of the ethical issues that arise um, because of the implementation of those control measures. Um, and lastly, uh, I'll just do a quick summary. Now, public health surveillance isn't new uh, to us. Um, it's been ongoing since the 1600s and the 1700s. And many of you might be quite familiar um, with this definition of uh, public health surveillance by the WHO. Uh, now, the purpose of public health surveillance, well, it enables us to um, detect high risk um, areas where disease burden may be higher. Uh, it allows us to also manage outbreaks uh, and it also informs policy and practice. So public health surveillance um, is quite an important uh, function uh, for health authorities and governments around the world. Now, I'll be talking specifically about dengue transmission, and some of you might be quite familiar with this. Um, in order for, dengue, uh, for a dengue infection to occur, you need these three elements. So you need um, humans, uh, you need the virus, and then you need the mosquito, which is the vector. If you remove any of these elements, uh, then infection cannot occur. Now, um, one of the best forms of protection against disease, uh, as we know, um, is obviously vaccination. Um, but for uh, a multitude of reasons uh, involving cost, um, effectiveness, safety, uh, programs to implement uh, mass immunization, um, this may not be the preferred method at this point in time. So in many settings, especially resource poor settings, uh, then vector control remains the primary mode uh, for disease control. Now we heard um, Dr. Samira talking about um, different entomological control measures uh, in her presentation. Um, so I won't elaborate very much into that, but just to summarize that um, often when we want to do vector control for dengue, uh, we target both the um, immature as well as the mature stages um, of the vector and using uh, either physical, chemical or biological or a combination perhaps uh, of these methods, uh, we can try to reduce the vector populations. Uh, now, each of these uh, approaches, however, requires some form of access. So either access into homes, um, access into construction sites or um, even other premises where um, occupants uh, uh, may have a say uh, in whether health inspectors have the right to enter their homes. Um, so in the next couple of slides, I'll be using some examples from Singapore just to demonstrate um, how we um, address these ethical issues. Um, so this includes permission for home access, um, how we deploy vector control resources objectively, uh, and lastly, uh, because the implementation of disease control measures um, often gives rise to, the um, to more opportunities to collect data, um, how do we protect um, data and confidentiality? Uh, now, some of you have, uh, may have been to Singapore or you may have heard uh, uh, about Singapore or a lot about Singapore. And um, some say uh, that there are many rules in Singapore to follow uh, and um, it's, it's hard to keep up. Um, well, I would say truthfully uh, that in the, it, with respect to vector control, uh, having some of these rules backed by legislation um, has been helpful. So in Singapore, when there's a disease outbreak, uh, we see that um, there are these inspectors that may uh, attempt to enter um, people's homes in order to uncover and remove larval breathing habitats. Now, what we see over here in the law, uh, it's called the uh, Control of Vectors and Pesticides Act. So it says over here that if you don't have the permission of the occupier, you're not allowed to enter the house, but if you wish to enter the house because you need to do your job, uh, then you have to provide a notice with at least 12 hours of notice um, prior to entry. So this in a way uh, protects the occupier uh, from any attempts to enter the house uh, when the occupier is unwilling or when the occupier is not prepared. Uh, now we also have um, a, uh, um, addi an additional section 
in cases, and this is uh, hardly used, but sometimes homes aren't occupied for some reason. Uh, perhaps it is because the occupants are living overseas temporarily, or they've gone for um, leisure travel in another country. Uh, and then in an outbreak scenario where we need to um, search for and remove larval breeding habitats, then we may need to enter um, these homes uh, using forced entry. But if that would be the case, uh, then we would have legislation uh, to support that act. But we would also uh, display a notice to give um, the occupant uh, sufficient time to respond to us, um, as well as to um, facilitate our entry if um, they, are, uh, they may be living in a home elsewhere uh, and they may be notified by their neighbor that there's a notice. So in the next slide, um, I'll ju it's just a one minute video. Um, I'll show you what uh, our officers uh, do. No sound is coming through. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm terribly sorry that uh, the sound didn't go through, but hopefully uh, the subtitles were useful uh, for you. Um, so let's just get on with the presentation. Yes. Um, so one of the challenges that uh, we have um, in Singapore as well as other countries is um, in order to discover um, where larval habitats might be, uh, we often need to access um, quite inaccessible places. Um, so for example, we may need to check a roof gutter that's on the second or the third story of a house. And to do so would require an immense amount of resources. Uh, this may involve us um, hiring uh, a lorry with uh, you know, a cherry picker, uh, and then it costs a lot. But technology has evolved in the last decade or so. And we see the use of drones uh, being popularized um, all, over, all over the world. So if you can see, uh, this is a picture of a drone uh, on the left, on the top left, and it has a camera that's mounted at the bottom. And the pilot uh, would control the flight of the drone. Uh, and this LCD screen uh, would be streaming the footage live. Now in Singapore, uh, only licensed drone pilots um, are authorized to use these drones. And the piloting process is such that um, one officer will pilot the drone while the other serves as a safety officer. The safety officer also needs to be trained uh, and licensed as a drone pilot. So they function as a pair. Now, the use of drones uh, can be uh, quite tricky in the sense uh, that uh, we would um, need to seek occupant permission uh, before we deploy the drone. Uh, and that's to respect the privacy of the occupant. Uh, we would also plan for a direct flight path such that if possible, we would try to avoid the windows uh, and go up as quickly as possible. No video footage is retained. It is st streamed um, so that the pilot uh, can um, inspect um, the roof gutter or inspect the hard to reach places. Uh, and uh, a picture is normally taken of any larval habitats that are found and shown directly to the occupant. But this picture is not retained and is deleted immediately. Um, now, the second thing that we do uh, in Singapore is every year we'll generate um, a map 
uh, of the dengue risk anticipated in the next year. And we use uh, machine learning to generate these risk maps. So you can see here on the left uh, that the darker areas represent uh, the areas with higher risk, while the areas in green represent those with lower risk. Um, all vector control resources in Singapore are allocated according to disease burden. So it doesn't matter whether um, it's an estate where there are a lot of expensive houses or there's an estate with a lot of um, uh, public housing. Um, the allocation of resources just merely follows the disease burden. Um, and this is an objective way uh, in order to carry out disease control. Now, I shared earlier that the implementation of vector control activities also presents the opportunities for collecting data and how we manage data um, is quite important because we don't want to um, create stigmatization. So over here, you can see in the top left, uh, these are shaded areas depicting um, areas where disease transmission is occurring. Uh, we code them at different colors. So in the middle uh, is the red zone, which is a high risk area. And then at the side are yellow uh, coded zones. Uh, as you can see, these zones are large and uh, they do not identify any single uh, premises or home uh, where the dengue case has been reported. And we do this to protect the confidentiality um, of people with dengue infections. Um, online on our website uh, is also information that we uh, provide uh, to people who are living in this area. So as you can see in the bottom left, uh, we can see that uh, there are these purple zones with high uh, levels of Aedes aegypti activity. And again, uh, no individual homes or premises are being highlighted. We always uh, present aggregated data. And then on the right, you can see these are the list of areas uh, where active transmission um, is occurring. Um, if you would like to find out more, you can visit this website, uh, this link that I've provided below. So uh, just a very, very quick summary. Um, I mentioned before that surveillance and control measures, they are extremely important uh, for disease control. Um, the second thing is that uh, the implementation of surveillance and control activities uh, may give rise to some ethical issues. Um, and lastly, uh, if we acknowledge and respond to these challenges, uh, then they are um, useful and essential for building public trust and for disease control programs to work, uh, it's very important to build that public trust. Okay, I think with that, um, I will end my presentation. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Joel, for an excellent uh, presentation on vector control and surveillance ethical concerns. Um, Dr. Joel highlighted the importance of public health surveillance in vector control and he gave the example of dengue uh, control in Singapore, where he lighted, uh, highlighted the transmission measures, the physical, chemical, and biological control measures, the role of drones in vector control, and how implementation of public health measures under community conditions sometimes may be challenging. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Joel, for an excellent presentation. I'd like uh, now to move to our uh, fourth and last uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Uh, Francine Ntumi, who's going to talk about ethics and vector-borne diseases, perspectives from Central Africa. Dr. Ntumi is the Executive Director of the Congolese Foundation for Medical Research in the Republic of Congo. She's also a lecturer in immunology at the University of Marianne Ngobi uh, in the same place. She's an Associate Professor at the University of Tübingen in Germany and member of several scientific committees, as well as international scientific networks in Africa. Her, aim, her main areas of research uh, is malaria. Throughout her career, she's been uh, training African scientists of various nationalities in disciplines such as immunology, as well as molecular epidemiology. 12 years ago, she led the Congolese Foundation for Medical Research, aiming at strengthening health research activities on infectious diseases in the Republic of Congo, and 11 years ago, she's been involved in developing health research capacities in Central Africa throughout the coordination of the EDCTP-funded Central 
Africa Network on TB, HIV, AIDS, and malaria. And uh, also, uh, she has been very active with the Pan-African Network for Rapid Research, Response, Relief, and Preparedness for Infectious Disease uh, uh, Epidemics. Um, uh, Dr. Ntomi is Vice President of the African Academy of Science for Central Africa. And between uh, 2007 and 10, she led the Multilateral Initiative on Malaria and is recipient of several scientific international awards, including the African Union Kwame uh, Purnoma Regional Scientific Award for Women. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Francine Tumi, who's going to talk to us about ethics and vector bone diseases perspectives from Central Africa. Dr. Francine, please. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Manzil. But in fact, I will not do uh, the presentation. I will just give some comments uh, on what I have heard and uh, what, are, what I've seen, uh, synergies or uh, similar situation between the IMR region and the, the African region. So it will not be a presentation. I just share some thoughts uh, about uh, these vector bone disease, uh, ethical issues uh, in vector bone disease. So, uh, vector control. So, <laughs> okay. So, first of all, I, it's very, uh, it should be very clear. So, I'm not an ethicist, I'm just a molecular biologist, a researcher uh, based in Central Africa. And for Africa, I mean, the most, the major vector bone disease is malaria. And uh, the, the other presenters presented very clearly what is the issue with, with malaria. But in, so in Africa and in Central Africa, where I come from, uh, Plasmodium falciparum as a vector is the most predominant vector. So we share many similar challenges. Uh, from what I have heard. And clearly there is a need for new and innovative uh, interventions uh, against vector bone diseases. Uh, but this, yeah, this intervention should be evaluated, implemented in a proper way. It has been clearly also stated by the previous speakers. But it should also address individual and communities' decision respecting dignity, justice for solving a com um, common public health um, issue. So, uh, I just want to yeah to highlight some uh, some questions and some thoughts uh, on these ethical challenges from my experience. I have worked 20, more than twenty years on malaria, and so at uh, when there is a distribution of prevention tools like uh, nets and uh, insecticide, how the individual and community uh, is engaged in the decision. Uh, in Congo, I, I have not seen really the community engagement really supported before a distribution. So at the end of the day, the vector control um, uh, intervention is not uh, successful or not successful as expected because the population has not fully understood how to use the, the proposed tool and how the justice is respected as well, how the minorities and vulnerable people are considered. Here in Central Africa, we have vulnerable population uh, in the, the uh, we called autochtone people. The, in, uh, in old books, it was the pygmies uh, people. So this uh, population autochtone are very, really vulnerable. So there is a need to really adapt the vector control program to their uh, behavior, to their context. And that's also very important. Uh, many vector control program on malaria use uh, the massive distribution of uh, bed nets for pregnant women and children. There are many uh, here uh, women 
uh, with mental diseases going on on the street, how this vulnerable population is considered for benefiting of this, um, uh, of this uh, measure. So that's some issues uh, I have. And uh, also the methods of control. You talk about insecticide, but I have one, the genetic based method for vector control is quite an innovative, um, innovative uh, tool, but not yet implemented, but the research is going on. So, and for me, it's a really good example on how the research ethics, the community should be engage at the same time while developing the tools because at the moment we are talking of uh, researchers are talking about population suppression or population replacement of mosquito so who will decide for the replacement or suppression the researchers or the beneficiaries of this tool so that's very important who will decide um, for uh, for the yeah for the use of uh, uh, proposed tool. And also, I think the speaker also uh, highlighted the importance to use existing, you know, uh, use both to, to, to encourage people to use properly both uh, uh, vector control tools. So that's some issues I have seen on, um, yeah, uh, in the Central African uh, regions and uh, in how to really, uh, the ethical issues raised by uh, yeah, uh, this vector control, um, vector control uh, measures. But to finish, really, I, I have to say I'm a simple researcher, but I really appreciate, uh, 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 yeah, a brochure, a document that will guide us to really adopt. First, we will adopt and then adapt to our context and also the context of using our values or issues and not forgetting to empower local ethics committees and also regulatory authorities. So that will be my remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Francine, for excellent uh, remarks. Indeed, the problems with vector borne diseases, prevention and control, as well as ethical issues, are the same in different regions of the world which suffer from vector borne diseases. Indeed, inter regional collaboration is necessary because vectors do not uh, respect borders, and especially regions which share borders, like the Eastern Mediterranean and the African, as well as Asian regions need uh, to work uh, together in order to uh, be successful in vector control as the guidance document shows. And the last uh, few minutes, uh, actually, um, we have one minute for each uh, speaker. For uh, Dr. Coleman, uh, there was a question from uh, Natasha Anwar. She was saying that many countries where vector bone disease is endemic do not have infrastructures or mechanisms or experts available to put together risk benefit assessments. Can uh, our uh, group uh, who actually put the guidance document together see its role expanding to perhaps assist countries with this uh, uh, aspect? Dr. Coleman, please. Um, yeah, that's a, a very important point. And it was discussed in the guidance, um, the importance of um, the international community making an effort to build capacity in countries that don't have um, um, that capacity already. So, I mean, this is a problem not limited to, to vector-borne diseases, um, but um, I, I think one of um, WHO's roles is, um, is working with countries to develop this, this capacity. Um, and there are other existing efforts in, in, in other areas that could be drawn on, but there's, there's really, I don't have a very simple answer to this question. It's, it's sort of a general problem with the, the, the lack of capacity that needs to be addressed is just yet another um, area where this is, is, is in need. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Coleman. Uh, Dr. Samira, there was a question about how do countries which share borders but are in conflict help each other uh, in vector control. Dr. Samira Biryani, please. Yeah. 
Yeah, thank you. Uh, so at the moment we have, we currently have the two EMRO networks, uh, the Hanamat, which is the, the Horn of Africa. Uh, and these are neighboring countries uh, for uh, working together to, for the monitoring of the efficacy of the drug, um, anti-malarial drug, and also for vector control. Uh, the other, uh, uh, the other PIAMAT is the Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Iran uh, network. Also, these work together for uh, capacity building. For example, uh, in Iran, Iran is supporting Afghanistan for insecticide resistance and identifying mechanisms of insecticide resistance. So these are the current uh, vector control, uh, sorry, the current EMRO networks for uh, vector-borne diseases at the moment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Samira. Before we give the floor to Dr. Rice, I was under, wondering if Professor Farhat Muazzam would like to share her views about today's uh, webinar. Dr. Muazzam, please. Okay. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. Loud and clear. Okay. Dr. Mandel, I'll be very brief. Number one, I have, um, it's, it's really, I'm delighted at uh, some of the information that has come through and I hope it will be useful. I'll just make one comment and which is that essentially WHO works and EMRO in this case, as this is the region we are looking at, they come up with a great deal of guidelines and those are important. However, if you look at the diversity of the countries that are included within EMRO, in the final analysis, contextually, each of them, we can take help from each other, but it is going to be the responsibility of each country because we have so much diversity. And even if, as was raised, between Pakistan and Afghanistan, between Pakistan and Yemen, the, each of them have their own specific issues. And I think public health is the least developed area in our part of the world. And I'm coming from my own experience in Pakistan. So all I can say is that this requires really to make or break the success of these guidelines requires on site within each country, a great deal of effort. And I hope right now, as has been pointed out already, with public health surveillance, et cetera, is concerned. It is unfortunately, it has not been the top priority of these countries. So thank you very much for allowing me to make the comment. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Muazzam. And we do appreciate your leadership um, in the CBEC as well as its activities in support of WHO's work um, in um, uh, uh, vector control, uh, ethics, as well as ethics at large uh, from an academic and administrative uh, viewpoints. The final word, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to give to Dr. Andreas Rice, who is the co-lead of Global Health Ethics in WHO Geneva. Um, he has been coordinating this uh, guidance document for more than two years and also the Secretariat of the Global Network of Collaborating Centers, including the ones in our region, uh, the Collaborating Center in Karachi, in Tehran, and hopefully very soon in Beirut. Ladies and gentlemen, we all welcome Dr. Andreas Reis for concluding remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Mandil, and thanks everyone who's on the line. I, uh, I know we are already out of time, so I will uh, be very brief in my uh, closing remarks. I really want to uh, thank uh, Dr. Mandil um, at the regional office for the excellent uh, collaboration um, that we are having in the area of bioethics with our regional office and uh, also our collaborating center colleagues, um, Dr. Muazam and uh, Jaffrey for the excellent uh, collaboration as a um, collaborating center of WHO in the area of bioethics, not only in vector-borne diseases, but in, in many other um, aspects. And um, I, I think uh, it's very important um, to note that we have such uh, centers of excellence uh, around the globe. 
but uh, uh, especially also in the EMRO region. I also want to thank the four speakers who I think have given us a very um, um, diverse uh, perspectives on the topic. Uh, Carl Coleman, who had been the lead uh, writer of this uh, document and uh, I think knows it by heart, gave an excellent overview. Um, and we heard uh, uh, a really uh, very clear, uh, excellent presentation from uh, Dr. Samira about the situation um, in the EMRO region, uh, followed by um, um, Joel, who uh, has been really on the forefront of uh, the modern technologies in, in surveillance uh, for BBDs and also contributed greatly uh, to our working group uh, over the years. And then finally, the very important perspective interregionally from uh, Professor uh, Francine Toomey. So I, I think this has been um, a really a great panel. Thank you also for um, all your excellent questions. And um, I just uh, uh, put through the uh, link, I'm, I'm seeing that it does not work. It must be due to the uh, restructuring of WHO's website at the moment. But uh, just to note also that the translation is already ready. It's still being proofread um, and it will be uh, sent out um, and published uh, um, very soon. Um, and then finally, I want to pick up on the important point that uh, Dr. Uh, Farhat uh, made. I think uh, it's very important to see that we have these global guidelines but uh, the implementation really depends on all of you in the countries. And I think we have uh, both the uh, colleagues from national vector borne disease programs uh, online, but also the national ethics committees. And I think uh, both um, these constituencies have a very important role to play to um, implement and adapt these uh, guidelines to the national context. And I, I hope that uh, we have uh, convinced you and, and uh, won you as, uh, as uh, supporters in uh, this endeavor um, in uh, trying to integrate ethical aspects into vector-borne disease control. With that, I would like to uh, thank everyone uh, again and maybe turn it back to uh, Dr. Jeffrey um, for just a, a final remark. Thank you very much. Just, uh, just to um, uh, add to your uh, thank you remarks to everyone, all the panelists, they've already done a lot of uh, hard work in putting these together. And uh, uh, as I was mentioned in the beginning, this is a series of uh, uh, webinars for dissemination of these uh, uh, documents. Uh, and we'll be doing this uh, a couple of times again, and we'll be going uh, and making our announcements through our website. Uh, we were unable to take some of the questions because of the shortage of time, but we hope to do so and address all these questions in the next two encounters on the 11th and the 17th of December. So thank you again, uh, the Dr. Race, for providing us with this opportunity, not only to be part of the development of these guidelines, but also in its dissemination. It's, it's really good to see things coming to the fruition. So great to be uh, involved with, with WHO. Thank you very much and um, goodbye.